Um, my name is Ellen Toscano, and I am very pleased to welcome you to the fourth, the penultimate Women in Migrations conversation. More on ultimate later. Um, last week, we had a bit of good news in the world of migration. Supreme Court on Friday ruled against the Trump administration's effort to end the DACA program. There are an estimated 649,000 immigrants in the United States who had work permits and protection from deportation uh, under DACA at the end of 2019. So this is at least a temporary um, victory. Um, unless the president backs down, unlikely, or a new president's elected, it could come back to the court. So vote everybody if you can. It's the end of my political statement of the morning. Um, this series is convened by the Women in Migrations Working Group, an interdisciplinary project founded in June of 2017 in Florence, Italy. Um, we will put a citation of the book, which resulted from the initial convening uh, in the chat. Um, after Florence, we convened in Abu Dhabi and hoped to be in person in DC and Athens this spring and summer. For obvious reasons, that wasn't possible. But thanks to the assistance of our partners and supporters, we convened by Zoom. Thank you to NYU DC and the Bradamus Center, both represented by our colleagues, Tom and Polly. Thanks to them for remarkable um, help in coordinating and technology. Thanks also to NYU's Office of Global Inclusion, Diversity and Strategic Innovation, and to the Ford Foundation for its support. The goal of the working group is to examine the role that art, history, and literature have played in identifying and remembering the migratory experiences of women. Women have been part of global and historical movements of people to escape war, to avoid persecution for work, for security, and now because of the pandemic. Women have been uprooted, stolen, trafficked, enslaved. They have been displaced from land, despoiled of resources and habitats lost to extreme weather patterns and climate change. The public policy lens through which migration is generally analyzed is one vantage point and a central one to be sure, but we hope that our wide interdisciplinary lens will broaden the conversation and deepen understanding, opening a space of reflection and commitment. A quick word on my use of penultimate to describe this session. Why, while we had intended to convene only four June sessions, we have been delighted to see that colleagues in Italy, in Italy and elsewhere in the world have joined as audience. In particular, I want to thank Deborah Spini and Alessandra Capodacqua from Italy. Both were part of our original convening. And it occurred to Dr. Willis and I that a final summer Zoom session should be devoted to the same range of issues with our colleagues from around the world. Um, both Deborah and Alessandra will help us to organize um, an international session. So stay tuned for more information on the ultimate session in August. Logistical notes, we will leave time at the end of the presentations uh, for questions and we invite you audience members to uh, submit questions as they occur to you in the Q&A section, not the chat. Um, if you have a question for a particular panelist, please indicate which. The conversation will be closed captioned and recorded. Today's convening will be moderated by Dr. Deborah Willis and Dr. Cheryl Finley. At the beginning of the year, <clears throat> the indefatigable Dr. Willis curated an important exhibition at MICA entitled uh, Migrations and Meaning in Art. And we include in the chat also um, uh, a link for you to be able to see some of that work. And finally, I am so pleased to bring back Dr. Lisa Coleman, one of the steadfast contributors, supporters, and organizers. She is the inaugural Senior Vice President for Global Inclusion, Diversity, and Strategic innovation at NYU. She's incredibly busy, but has devoted time, attention, and love to this series. So we're really 
super happy to have her with us. Lisa. Thank you so much, Ellen. It's a pleasure to be back with you all today. Uh, and so thank you everyone for joining us for the penultimate program. And we look forward to the next one, obviously, focusing uh, on our global partners. Uh, I hope everyone, again, as I usually start off, is taking really good care and staying well during these times. And so before uh, we begin, I always like to take a moment of silence to honor the lives and legacies of the ancestors who've gone before us and paved the way for us to carry this work forward, this work of liberation, and to honor those uh, people whose land upon we currently sit and occupy. I'd like to also thank everyone whose invisible work is so uh, rarely recognized, especially those people working behind the scenes uh, to keep us all safe. And here, of course, I always think about uh, the delivery workers, et cetera, and all of those people. The current social clarity on protest against racial violence brings to the forefront the ways that intersectionality compounds the vulnerability of women of color who are often allocated as, as essential workers during this uh, pandemic. And we adamantly, um, know that uh, essential is not, does not mean expendable. And I'm so happy to see so many people focusing on uh, the, uh, uh, where women are today. Um, thank you to Deb, Ellen, Cheryl, Ta and Tom, and thank you to the uh, IAA, Tish, 370J Project, the Ford Foundation, NYU DC, Spelman's AUC Art Collective, uh, and of course my team within OGI for all of the great work. Um, we've had a rich uh, dialogue this summer discussing so much of the important of uh, women and their migratory experiences. And thank you to all of the participants. The pandemic and the concurrent uh, escalation of national attention to the deeply entrenched racism in the US and the racist violence globally uh, against uh, people um, has perhaps more than now than ever, right, underscores the urgency and need for these kinds of conversations and to sustain ourselves in the future. Um, this, uh, this program, we've been uh, doing this work for the course of a year, uh, which is focusing on our NYU Women 100 program. And that's really the commemoration of the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment. But as some have heard me say before, uh, at NYU, we've been really um, looking at those who were historically overlooked during that moment in the early uh, early 20th century and how we can focus on um, women of color, uh, transgender, non-binary experiences. Um, so we're happy again to just an honor to be a partner on this uh, 2020 Women in Migration series. And as Ellen said at the beginning, um, we had hoped to be uh, to see you in person, but we look forward to that opportunity when we're able to uh, gather again. So thank you again to everyone who's brought us together in this intimate dialogue about the lives and legacies and story of women who have been displaced, made trafficked, enslaved, made insecure historically and today, and how we can come together uh, to connect across our global and generational uh, 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 differences. So thank you again for joining us. And now I turn the program back over to uh, Deb, uh, the indefinable Deb Willis. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much, Lisa. And I'm happy to see all of you here and see over 167 names um, as participants today. So it's really exciting. Uh, we're going to move right into the program. And I'm excited to turn the mic over and the images over to Leslie King Hammond. Dr. Leslie King Hammond is an artist and scholar and a fantastic storyteller. Thank you, Leslie. <laughs> Thank you so much, Deb. Let me first give my, my uh, acknowledgments to everyone. Uh, Deb, Ellen, Sharon, Autumn, and of course our tech god, Tom, what project could be successful without the people who are behind the scenes supporting us. I um, have spent my professional life as an educator, administrator, curator, and an art historian. And even though I was trained as an artist and loved being in the art world, I was very angry at a young age and sort of lost my innocence somewhere between Emmett Till and reading the diary of Anne Frank. And so I would um, sort of hide in my little world in my room and make my art and never had any intention of showing my art because my art was a way of soothing my anger and my few confusion. 
So my artistic making was relegated to soothing, uh, finding a place of solace. Um, and my home and my studio became a sacred kind of spiritual sanctuary. So for life as a black woman in grad school and working in white institutions, it was hard. It's very, very difficult. And I needed a safe place to begin to express myself and purge the relentless atrocities of sexism and racism. So exhibiting my work did not become a priority until Deb Willis walked into my life and disrupted my entire, I thought, sacrosanct way of living. And as she did that, she walked into my house and I said, Deb, let's go up to my studio on the third floor because I had a townhouse, 19th century townhouse. And Deb walked into my living room and took one look at my mantle, a carved wooden mantle. And she said, I want that. And I went, oh my God. And it had not occurred to me that I had transformed so many areas into my house, into various aesthetic installations and expressions about my life. And it began to be a reality that it was my grandmother in this photograph that you see, who was the one who was the um, one who gave me that unconditional love, that permission, um, that encouragement. Part of it was due in fact, because I was born with a very rare massive tumor that nobody knew about until I almost died. My mother was a nurse and recognized that something was wrong. And so I had surgery. And this is a photograph of me and my grandmother right after the surgery. I was the first child born in the family. Um, she called me new, Nuni, because I was the new one. And as I grew up, she was always there. Now, my grandmother was born and raised in Barbados all the women on the island were educated in needle arts. So they were fabulous at making all kinds of crochet, drawn needle thread, embroidery, um, um, and, and fabulous seamstress. Tom, next slide. So as I grew up, my grandmother, of course, as you see, dressed me like a little princess because at the time, of course, you could not buy clothes. You couldn't go to the store and shop because these were the days of segregation. And I was a child that was raised by depression culture parents. And so all of my clothes were made by my grandmother. My grandmother came to the United States around World War I. She, gra she gra migrated during the Great Migration, the first wave, and she became part of the garment industry in New York City, having settled in East New York of Brooklyn, New York City. Next slide. So here, in this altar that I built, I became, this, and this is the second altar, I can't imagine, Deb, Deb saw this altar that I made, the very first one, in my home, and it was not in this construct, but it had a kind of uh, all of the accoutrements. I began to look very hard at my family. So the works on either side of the mantelpiece are my aunt's crocheted works. One on the right side, as you are viewing it, are my aunt Lily, and she was a fabulous crochet uh, artist. On the left side is my aunt Lisa, who was my grandmother's older sister. And she would do drawn thread embroidery, meaning she would take a piece of fabric and she would remove the fiber to create the designs. So as I began to have all of these elements in my life and collecting them, and I also started becoming fascinating with the fact of all of the anonymous women who made handmade items to decorate, ornament, and make their spaces beautiful and sacred. I began to collect them. So as I created this altar again, I went, can I have the next slide please? I went to look carefully at the elements that were particularly telling with my grandmother. So on the top shelf of the altar, you will see that there are various bottles and jars and they hold the kind of like uh, apothecary, the uh, um, a pharmacopoeia of what in the Caribbean was used to make curatives and poultices and 
all kinds of salves. The second shelf are teas because my grandmother, and of course on my grandmother's side of the family, we were um, very much acculturated by British traditions, having Barbados been uh, colonized by the Brits. And you will see all kinds of teapots and, and glass jars, a beautiful perfume jar that she left me because I loved a perfume. But the thing that was also very telling about my grandmother is that there were two things she loved dearly, and that was her family and her church. And my grandmother spent over 35 years working in the garment industry. And between working in the garment industry and taking care of her family, the other thing that she took care of was her church, St. Barnabas Church in Brooklyn, which is still very active in a very Caribbean oriented community. So her job in the church was that she made all of the dressings, the tableware, the, the altar, the dressings, all of the priest's vestments, all of the vestments for the choir, all of the vestments for the choir master who was her son. And she did this diligently every week. She was a very quiet, religious, spiritual woman. And it never occurred to me how this became a point of reference for me to deal with. So next slide, please. In this altar installation, I also create a table. And on this table, this little table is a wash bowl, all right? Because of course, in Barbados, you have also the need for um, washing and, and, and getting fresh water. And in this particular instance, I place in the bowl hibiscus, which is one of the national flowers of Barbados, and also a healing element in terms of making teas and curatives. Again, a hand-woven crocheted um, tablecloth that I found, and then a rounded cowrie shells, because of course the Caribbean is very, very important for sea life. Next, next slide. And around the altar at the base, I place dinner plates. Dinner plates and shells, more shells as ornamentation as if I am crocheting with shells or decorating the edge around it. And the plates tell the story about African food ways and the foods in the Caribbean that were absolutely seminal and important to the history of how we survived in this world. Next slide. The story really ends and doesn't end. It found out that begins with this woman here who is my great great grandmother, Mama Dodds, as we used to call her. And it was only about 10 years ago when I was taking care of my um, mother's youngest son, who was in his 80s. And I was talking about this woman and I said, she was a mulatto, wasn't she? Or she was blended or, or, or mixed. And he looked at me very strangely. He said, no, she was from England. I said, what do you mean she was from England? He said, she came from England. So my question is for me now, because she is the one who taught my grandmother and all of her sisters. She had eight children. She married my grandfather, who was of uh, Congo color, blue black. And I am very fascinated about in her time of history, how she got to Barbados. My great grandfather was a merchant marine. So I romanticized about the idea that, oh, maybe they met on a journey and he went over and they fell in love and came back. But then as I'm doing research, I'm finding out that Britain is responsible for having used Barbados as the island to cultivate the atrocities and brutalities of slavery, which were then disseminated throughout the world. Sugar was the cocaine of the time. And so to get the sugar, they needed labor. And when they didn't have enough labor, they imported Brits, hundreds of thousands of Brits who quote unquote were indentured servants or basically slaves with worse or similar conditions as slaves. And so I begin to ask myself because my great great grandmother came in at this time and the Brits would be very cavalier about transporting children, hundreds and thousands of them between the ages of 10 to 19 into the island of Barbados to work. Naturally, That's half it. of them died. So yeah. with that, yeah. this is where my story ends and I'm done. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>
<laughs> Thank you, love. <laughs> I knew Dave was coming. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, Sama. <laughs> In my recent solo exhibition, Staging the Imagined, I presented a dualistic critique of photography's historic role in the construction of the Middle Eastern woman by framing how the region itself was and continues to be imagined. Utilizing traditional printing methods of albumin and photogravures and presenting archival ma um, materials, I gestured to the problematic history of colonial era photography made by Europeans in North Africa and the Middle East. Mm. The exhibition also includes screen prints and video that came about in the mid 20th century. Staging the Imagine marked my own approach to women in migration studies through a visual lens of mobility, resistance, and possibility. The exhibition interrogates what it means to embody my own position as the diasporic female subject. I have long been interested in the image of, Arab, of the Arab female figure, which is a rich and complicated site in our visual culture. For example, in mid to late 20th century art, Palestinian art, depictions of the Palestinian national resistance are expressed through a feminized homeland, the rendering of the female peasant as motherland. In her book, Images of Women, author Sarah Graham Brown writes, when looking at photographs in the context of social history, a number of other forms of meaning have to be taken into consideration. These include the relationships of power and authority between photographer and subject, as well as the way the photograph might be understood by its viewers in a particular historical period. The invention of photography itself coincided with European imperialism on a global scale. Historical photographs depicted this unequal power relationship between the West and the societies under its domination for over a century. Relationships between, the, between colonizer and colonized can be realized through fantasies constructed by the European photographers and projected onto their subjects, who often had little power to control their own representation. I reference this image history by activating my own body as a mobile medium, moving and carrying multiple histories and perspectives through my overlapping identities. Rooted in my own origins of traumatic displacement, my practice is a union of these immediate concerns, the afterlife of forced, mar forced migration, social fragmentation, and forever wars. I was born in Basra, Iraq, to an Iraqi father and a Palestinian mother, a refugee who moved to Iraq as a child after losing her homeland in Palestine in 1948. I, be I became a political refugee myself when I was displaced by the Iraq-Iran War of the 1980s. Along with my parents and siblings, we escaped from the war only to enter years of migration and illegality. This component of my personal history is key to understanding my practice. My perspective has been cemented by this double generational displacement and followed by years of living in the United States as an undocumented person, another kind of psychic displacement when we fell out of legal status. So when I look at recent photographs of women in Iraq standing in lines and stacking petrol cans or luggage on their heads, I am not only reminded about what shortages they face, but what forces are at play that will dematerialize their bodies and culture from the region. The 1948 Palestinian exodus, known as Al-Nakba, which is Arabic for the word catastrophe, has been described as a point in historical time that created an eternal present in collective Palestinian identity formation. The continuity of Nekba's trauma and the subsequent national struggle for this eternal present is found in carryover and is not simply a contemporary form of depicting displacement through the female figure. But a retracing of how feminized representations came to eulogize the Nekba and the internal, eternal present. So these are historical posters made by Palestinian artists and depicting imagery of, people, of the people's struggle through the woman's body. Uh, one second. Your images are not being seen by the participants. Uh, None of them? I'm just getting a text saying that. Uh, some, uh, some people are saying that they'll see a partial image. I think the panelists can see them because all of us have said we can see them. I the can panelists see. can, participants can't. Um, okay, okay, so how many images? Can they see them try, now? I try, try full screen now. Okay, so let's go on from. Okay. Should I go back? 
Okay, so I just, yeah, no, they said I can see the whole some image. Some people now. can see them, yeah. Yeah, some people can see them. I guess some people have different computers. Okay, so okay. you go ahead. We, right. can, we can circulate the images later too. Okay. All right, I'm just gonna go back one because yeah. it's, okay. it's a little bit important. Right. Um, so um, in the 1948 Palestinian exodus known as Al-Nekba, which is Arabic for the word catastrophe, has been described as a point of historical time that created an eternal present in collective Palestinian identity formation. The continuity of the Nekba's trauma and subsequent national struggle of this eternal present found in carryover is not simply a contemporary form of depicting displacement through the female figure, but a retracing of how feminized representations came to eulogize the Nekba and the eternal present. These are historical posters made by Palestinian artists and depicting imagery of the people's struggle through the woman's body and over her head. In Carry Over, I ask what photographic rep representations are among these origins. The first photographs made of Middle Eastern women were often taken to represent the Orient itself and its essential characteristics. Critic Tina Sherwell states that the Orient is not comprised of passive communities and that people of the Middle East were profoundly aware of the image they were assigned in the West. National struggles against colonial powers contoured elements upon which people saw themselves as constituting a nation and the gendering of the visuals that compose the homeland. When I look at recent photographs of women, oops, sorry. Orientalist photographers depicted the region's women as docile and expressionless and positioned them in consistent centered framing. It resulted in a kind of cataloging of bodies void of individuality, the oriental woman as the other. Meanwhile, in the West, women's suffrage and labor movements had taken root. Oriental photographs circulating across Europe sold the fact of sexual sites of freedom and experiment in which women's bodies existed for the pleasure of men. The picturesqueness of native cultures and nostalgia for primitive lives popularize such images in the European marketplace, but they also reflect the colonial struggle for power and influence by, ga by gaining access to Eastern women and articulating the dominance through depictions of women's bodies. The commercialism in the Orientalist photographs explains the rapid development of visual cliches about the Middle East, such as like water, vessel, the hookah, the lounging body, the Oriental carpet, the painted backdrops, and ethnic costumes. All of it were part of a dramatization of the Orient and photo photographic studios. So by blurring the boundary between decorative and functional, my images become metaphors for the ways in which Orientalism functions. The symbolic weight of signifiers is attached to everything. I imply that the subject is the bearer of this absurd and irrational, the critique of the Orientalist photographers. In this image, the mashrabiya, the arabesque latticework of carved wood normally found in the windows of Iraqi and Egyptian homes is substituted by laced razor wire wooden cutouts. I'm connecting the Western desire to peer into the fantasy of a harem's private world to the very real invisibility of Arab women's issues hidden by the West's obsession over their surface attire, the hijab. I'm especially interested in the interplay of representation of motherland through the female figure and farmer depicted by the village dress and the equalization of gender roles in the military struggle and the cultivation of land. Generation after generation recalls the political posters of the Arab revolutionary period of the 1960s. The era's advancements in cheap mass production printing technology provides a means for ordinary people to claim a voice in public space. Leila Khaled was a fighter in the Palestinian liberation movement. Her plane hijackings was widely reported in the international press and her image circulated everywhere. For revolutionaries, her image was elevated to an iconic status, an identity far beyond herself, appearing on graffiti murals across Israel separation walls in Palestine, as well as on t-shirts and memes. Her image served as the antithesis of the docile op oppressed woman. The Palestinian kufiya that she wore, which were historically worn by male farmers, is another enduring symbol of Palestinian resistance and one that is often misunderstood in the West. Other popular symbols associated with the national struggle are al Asqa Mosque in Jerusalem and the sacred cap, which is a sacred capital of a future Palestinian state, a sickle and the key, which are seen on the subject's belt, symbolizing the homes to which Palestinian refugees have no right to return to. But with my addition of the hollowed out travel trunk over the subject's head, the image also signals the worthlessness of cultural objects as representations of homeland. While I can symbolize homeland, 
I cannot take my homeland with me. The container is a dysfunctional shell, unworthy of housing anything but my dispossession. And finally, here I depict the empty jute baskets to carry the harvest of our land, as if filled out with the emptiness and void, and remembering its own former function and purposeful bounty. The baskets hover over my head, looted, uprooted, and suspended, and mirroring my own position as the diasporic female subject. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll have plenty of time for, with questions. Um, follow up. Adama Delphine. Passageways, secrets, traditions, spoken and unspoken, truths and untruths. My family, my being was and is impacted by migration and immigration. I am the first in my immediate family to be born in America. My parents migrated from Sierra Leone, West Africa in the 70s. I think about the violence of colonialism, so violent that independence only meant a new form of colonialism. I'm haunted by the idea of leaving home for a new and better life in a place of opportunity. But this place also dehumanizes you and benefits at the same time from your home, from the fruit of your home. The secrets from home, the longing, the stories, and the imaginary of one day returning home to liberate it and to start something new is what keeps us all going. This photograph of Grandma Adama was my comfort and connection to the faraway place that my parents called home. I only met her twice in my life, when I was four and when I was 20. The stories that I heard about her was how she would hand make, um, hand dye fabrics, batik fabrics, and she used that money in order to send her children to school, to university. Also, the story of grandma during the Civil War and how her and a whole bunch of other women, elderly women, escaped the war through the forest to find refuge in peaceful places. When I first learned to read at the age of seven, I performed, performed my first act of resistance by questioning my mom, why is the encyclopedia calling African savages? Back then, I didn't realize that I was instinctively fighting the delusion of white supremacy. All throughout my educational experience, I was bombarded and attacked with stories of the civilized saving the uncivilized. But the stories of home, the libations, the pulnadors, the deep-rooted mende and bube ways of being that extended beyond European contact is what keeps us going. In my art, I often use fabrics hand dyed by my grandma Adama. In this photograph, I am embodied by a fabric that she made with her hands and that my mom wore and then now it's with me. I'm laying comfortably on my mom's body, which is the most comfortable position in the world, but stories are always being transferred back and forth. I think about lineage, kinship, even beyond my immediate family, the stories and strength that connects the Black Atlas, power in the shape-shifting nature of us, despite of. My family history is complex. Grandpa, Grandpa Valcarcel, my mom's father, was an Afro-Cubano. During the early 1900s, somehow he returned home to Africa. I'm not sure if this was a symbolic return or if he actually knew his heritage. I've never met him because he passed on before I was even born. Pavel Carcel settled in Equatorial Guinea, had a rum business throughout West Africa. He moved back and forth between Sierra Leone and EQ. He met my abuela, Margarita, who was a very young person, and he had many kids before her to the point that he actually had a child at a certain age that was the same age as my grandma. Um, abuela, Margarita had many children, including my mom. And she tells me the story about one day her dad came and said, I'm going to send you to live with your sister in Freetown for better education and for a better life. My mom was resistant to, resistant to this move because she was only seven years old. Um, mom did eventually get used to her new home in Freetown, but shortly after the Civil War, after a Civil War um, happened in Equatorial Guinea, her mother had to move to Valencia, Spain, and mom and grandma were separated for over 10 years. They did not find each other until 1988 when mom had already immigrated to the US. My dad 
had big dreams. He moved to the United States with a bunch of his buddies to attend the New Schools for Social Research. They all had this dream of, cre of get, uh, obtaining PhDs and then returning home to change this newly, this new independent nature, um, nation. Unfortunately, the, the struggles of being an American in this, in this it, it, he, he was never able to change his, you know, go and fight for freedom in his country. I often visit Sierra Leone. I often visit Sierra Leone and I'm often conflicted between the spaces of the past, the present and the future. This home is the home that my mom grew up in and I wrote a little something for her. 157 Sakila Road, pro pronounced Circular Road in English, that's where mommy grew up. She reflects through windows, curtains, and carpeted floors in the board host, which stands over 100 years later. Her heart heavy in disbelief. Decrepit walls, once an elaborated dwelling, holds memories of a private school girl who once snuck out of that window there to steal a kiss from a young man that would one day become my daddy. Cheerful hot childhood memories of jumping down a flight of stairs that one cautiously climbs today fearful of a cave-in. They lived well for the 20 something years of her life until things started to dwindle after independence. This is when I intervene. As I feel the confusion in my unsettled stomach, how could things have been better under colonial rule? My memories at the tender age of seven or eight, as I nag my mom in our Brooklyn apartment, what is it like? What is it like in Salon, as Sierra Leone is effectively, affectionately called by its inhabitants? At four, my first visit brings abstract memories of curtains, laughter, and the sweet smell of palm oil stewing, cassava leaves, balogi and bitas, and okra soup. I didn't recall the cannibals, savages, and the scary place that they described the dark continent to be in school, textbooks, and on TV. I was embarrassed and confused for the first time. Why did they do that? I know too much now. My heart is heavy too, and I challenge her as, as she proudly confesses. Your Uncle Donald and Bethann Macaulay sued the hell out of the Sierra Leone Golf Club for their whites-only establishment. Can you imagine the nerve? Your uncles were in court with them for many years and won. She dwells on an imperfect past that was much better than today. I dwell on a past before her past that had to be better, a better foundation for what could be today. We both dwell from a distance, soon to return to the comforts of our Brooklyn apartment as the dwellers in our family home are uncertain of a future that can flourish with some investment, if you ask me. She seems hopeful and at times helpless, as I often wonder, what would have happened if she stayed and they never came and we were left alone, but the future prevails? Okay. Thank you. I, that's fantastic. I'm, I'm fascinated with the stories and the mothers and grandmothers. I would like for um, participants to please place your questions um, as we're moving through the process. Carolina. All right. Um... Hello, everybody. Um, just really briefly, I want to thank everybody, um, Ellen, Cheryl, Deb, and of course, Tom, for putting this great program together and for inviting me to be a part of it. So I only have eight minutes, right? So I'm going to jump right in. I'm a visual artist originally from Colombia, and I moved here uh, a long time ago. So it's been almost 20 years living pretty much in this area of Washington, D.C. And um, my work is um, socially and politically oriented. I talk about issues of migration, which is one of the subjects of this um, conversation. Uh, and it's related to women. I my, I, in my work, I talk about um, um, violence, uh, war, women, how we get, um, they get, or we get uh, caught in the, in the conflicts. And uh, uh, a lot about gender and um, cultural identity. Um, so um, the first image that I'm showing here, it's from a project that is uh, called um, Pigmentation. Instead of pigmentation, it's pink, P-I-N-K. And um, 
the, the, before I jump into the specifics of this piece, it's um, pink is a color that I've been using and I've been kind of infatu infatuated for the last um, 10 years or so. And so it's a color that I use uh, pretty much uh, aesthetically. I think it's a beautiful shade of red, a light shade of red. And also I use it conceptually because I find and um, beauty uh, that is related to beauty. And it also has all these stereotypes about um, uh, femininity. And uh, in a way, it's a, it's a, I use it as an as a embellishing element to sort of um, put things that are not exactly, to, to, to get my messages across in a way that people can see them uh, better. So if you put everything in pink, things don't look as bad as they actually are. So that piece was made in, um, in, um, for a festival in Charlottesville, Virginia, or a festival organized by Ed Woodham titled um, Art in Odd Places. He usually puts together this um, festival in uh, New York City, but uh, he decided to bring it to Charlottesville in 2018 to honor the victims of the tragic events that happened in Charlottesville in 2017. So basically my piece was, um, I was just in this outfit walking around, um, giving little pink cards to people in the street, to pedestrians. And basically I was listening to the song La Vie en Rose, uh, interpreted by Louis Armstrong. And I was just walking around giving these pink cards. They didn't have any logos, any writing. It was just kind of like that gesture of offering a little bit of pink to, to the victims and to the people that had to go through these um, horrible events. Um, again, using the same color last year, uh, February of 2019, I had this uh, um, um, installation artwork. Um, actually, I forgot to mention that, yeah, that's pretty much what I usually do. Uh, interdisciplinary media, uh, combining video installation, performance art, photography. Uh, this is a set of um, video sculptures and the, 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 the show was about home and homelessness and how women um, are usually the victims. Women and children are the most vulnerable to situations in their own countries, in our own countries um, of um, the, the human rights violations, they have to leave their towns because they're caught up in the middle of the conflict. And so I made these pieces and inside, inside of these pieces, there were little videos. And this is just a sample of me playing with these little um, uh, paper dolls. And if you notice, I'm, I'm flicking it. So it was little kind of like aggressive, aggressive gestures to these little figures. Sometimes I stepped on them sometimes i sort of like representing um you know what the things that they have to go through but put it putting it through um like a kid's kind of um play game and um, the, the 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 show also had a performance art component which is something that i've been doing for a long time as well and uh, these two characters are dancing stereotypical musics from their own culture by, and then the, the piano player, is, is com, com, he composed, he's a musician that composed the songs for, um, that people would be listening to uh, while, I, while we were performing. The difference was that if you notice one of the characters, we were, um, we were uh, playing music through headphones, stereotypical music, and then the audience would hear uh, what he's playing. So the, this piano, it was, um, he created his own compositions around sentences and excerpts of um, different testimonials that um, I found on, on the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. Like women, they have a space for, for um, at the OAS, at the Organization of American States, to come and voice and um, denounce the situations that they had to go through. So I found, um, a lot of testimonials, but I used just um, uh, excerpts uh, for, from some of them and some of the notes, some of the keys of the piano, instead of playing the actual note, it played 
the sound of some lady, um, just uh, little sentences from these testimonials. So it was a, a whole, a whole um, sculpture project. Uh, this piece here, it's um, some, some of the works I've done, and I think I presented this at some point at NYU for a PC for a show. It's called Made in the USA, uh, not made as M-A-D-E, but M-I-M-A-I-D, right? Like a, like a maid. And then, so, cause it's, it, it's playing with the stereotypes of um, la Latino immigrants or immigrants that always um, perform these kind of occupations in the service industry. So we, we sweep, we wash, we, um, in this case I was sweeping the first time I did this piece was in 2012 at the Corcoran Gallery of Art when we still had the venue for um, showing um, more contemporary art. And then this, this was in Montreal. Uh, I decided to uh, add the tape on my mouth as usually undocumented immigrants don't feel like they have a voice. That was part of the content. Um, I, I've been a waitress too carrying a tray. And um, one thing that I wanted to share is, this is the work that I'm doing right now. Um, I've been producing, I think I've made around 200 pieces of in the last uh, three months. It's a series that is called Pink Automatism, based on the surreal um, concept of automatic drawing, automatic painting, automatic, um, automatic um, writing. So it's basically just let your subconscious um, take over, right? And then responding to all the different situations. So uh, this is um, a piece that I made uh, last week in response to all the events that happened that we all know about. And uh, I just, uh, to wrap it up, I think I would love to, for people, whoever wants to try this automatic drawing, automatic art, it's, um, it's a lot of fun, basically, um, drawing and painting and doing whatever. But it's also, we have to remember that, you know, art is a tool. Art is a language of communication. And I always say, some people say, I don't know how to draw. I don't know how to do it. Just grab a pencil, grab a piece of paper and do whatever to express yourself. And um, I, I always, um, I'm going to quote one of my favorite artists, um, Joseph Boyce, he said, everybody can be an artist. So um, if, if you feel like it, it can also be a great tool. Uh, if you wanna express your voice, sometimes we say, sometimes we do different things to es express our feelings. So I say, um, if you wanna go ahead and grab a pen, it makes you happy. And if you wanna share it, now the times are, we're locked in. So basically uh, use your favorite social media to share, to, um, your, your work and it, it, it'll be, um, your, your message uh, will, will get across. Art is a great Thank tool you. that we all can use. You don't Thank have you to so get visual artists to do it. All okay. right. Thank you and we'll, we'll have more questions. And please, if you have questions again, to add to the conversation. And if you're having problems with the images, um, Nikki has said to restart the program and, and um, to troubleshoot the, through the website. But I think everybody seems to be okay by now. Okay, thank you, Carolina Muna. Hello, everyone. Um, so my name is Muna Malik. I am a multidisciplinary artist uh, based in Los Angeles. Uh, I started my career as a photographer. Um, but my photography always kind of focused on identity um, and less about the complexities of whatever camera I was using and more about expressing emotion or conversations that I was trying to have that oftentimes words just couldn't connect with. And so the, the very first image is probably the image that always sticks to me or sticks with me when I think about the photography I started making initially. And it's, um, it's of a Somali teen living in Minneapolis, Minnesota, where I had uh, part of my childhood. So I was born in Sana'a, Yemen, um, as a mixed race Somali uh, child. And from then on, my family eventually immigrated to the United States. And we found ourselves after a few moves in Minneapolis, Minnesota, which was a fairly confusing experience to go from 
living in the Middle East, um, mostly surrounded by Arabs, to living in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and mostly surrounded by either Somali Americans or Americans. Um, and at that point in my life, I hadn't really met any other Somalians outside the folks in my family. Uh, I couldn't speak the language. I spoke Arabic and English. And so I found myself looking like a lot of my peers, but completely feeling out of place because I didn't really fit with my American counterparts. I didn't really fit with my Somali counterparts just because we had very different childhoods. And so in that time as a teenager, I found myself can kind of confused and, and, and trying to figure out like identity wise where I fit in and photography helped me kind of bridge that bridge that divide. And this very first image is essentially a conversation around how a lot of Somali teens in Minneapolis or Muslim American teens in America feel about having to live between all of these different worlds. Um, representation in, in, in what you see in the mirror versus representation of what folks are saying about you and what they see when they look at you. Um, cultural representation as in cultural garb that you know oftentimes our parents would want us to wear to school or or food that your family would want to bring and having those key identity markers being used against you outside the context of a home kind of would always just be this this really hard struggle and so this image kind of encapsulates that for a lot of, of of somali teens mostly men in the in the community where religious uh how religious you were also came apart and how you kind of expressed yourself outside of your home. And so in 2016 or 17, I did the show called Behind Both Fences that exhibited at the Humphrey School in, in um, the University of Minnesota. And the exhibit basically was uh, a few different sets of portraits that studied basically the intricate dance that immigrant teenagers perform as they negotiate identities and navigate different cultural spaces. Um, the images reflected an effort to choreograph and express complexities that influenced how they view their how they viewed themselves and how others viewed them within like the American landscape. Um, oftentimes, grappling with like anti-immigrant discourse, um, one at a national level, which I think we can all kind of see in the world that we're living in in 2020. Things haven't really changed too much, um, and challenges faced within. Um, internal immigrant communities, right? Um, oftentimes these teens felt fenced off and disconnected from home or fenced off and disconnected from their peers outside of the home. And so this was kind of one way that I wanted to help showcase that with just a simple photograph that I think a lot of people can kind of connect to. Um, next slide. So with that in mind, um, as I kind of reached more into my adulthood, realizing that, you know, I'd spent most of my childhood um, not really connected to my Somali heritage or my family's or my mother's background specifically. Um, and so I kind of set out to do some identity discovery. And so in 2008, um, I took a very impromptu trip to Somalia, uh, to Somaliland specifically, to kind of just explore and figure it out on my own. I didn't really reach out to anyone, didn't have any real connections to connect to, um, and kind of just explored for a few days. So these next few shots are kind of just set the tone as to like the townships and cities that I was walking through. Um, but with Somali culture, within the very few first few days of talking to um, one person at the hotel that I was staying at and another person at a restaurant, I immediately got connected to this entire network of people that <laughs> in a lot of ways were just trying to help me meet family members that I either didn't know existed or had no real connection to. And so this is kind of what the environment really looked like. Children playing, families that happen to have goats would just like let them roam. Um, this was on the outskirts of Hedegesa. Uh, next slide. And as I continued to navigate the outs uh, the city, people would kind of using names. So um, in Somali culture, your name is attached to everything about you as far as like cultural identity and familial identity. And so using my name and my mother's name, people were able to find, um, you know, second cousins and, and, and everyone else that you could possibly think of. And so in that journey, I found myself every two or three days in a new township further and further outside of the city. And where the next photo project I'll speak about kind of started is when I finally got to this, um, this family's home, which wasn't really what Americans kind of view as a home, but probably the most 
happy people I've ever met in my life. Um, so they're kind of nomadic. They decided after the Civil War um, and a lot of the bloodshed that was, was spent during the Somali Civil War in the 90s to kind of just get away from city life entirely. They didn't want to be a part of the refugee um, be a part of refugee camps just because as you'll see in the next few photos there are a few um, younger kids within the family and they wanted to provide a sense of home and safety and in doing that they kind of went back to the nomadic traditions of Somali culture. Um, next slide. And so that meant living in a lot of homes like that and setting up different like shade structures, essentially in the middle of nowhere. Um, and this family in particular was very fortunate to have a few different forms of livestock. Um, in Somalia, livestock means wealth in some ways, or just livelihood. Um, and in the very far back of this image, you'll see that there was one camel that was kind of free to roam. Um, next slide. And so as I was continuing to do um, do this trip and meet more and more people, I found myself disconnected from the view that I had imagined I'd find in Somalia. So specific to photography, a lot of the imagery that I'd seen in the past was just black and white, people really sad, people kind of distraught. Um, a lot of the imagery I'd found was post-Civil War, or I shouldn't say post because Civil War in some ways is still kind of continuing, but um, just people having like really sad faces and, and, and kind of a disconnect. But when I received, when I was received by a lot of these people, it was the complete opposite. I think I, I could see the history in a lot of people's um, faces and the way that they welcomed me in a complete stranger was, was a bit surreal in a lot of ways. And so what I found myself was, um, I never actually picked up my camera the first few days that I'd met people. Um, I just spend time talking with them and learning about different stories. Uh, Somalis are considered to be poets and storytelling is one of the best things that they can do using poetry. And so I would find myself just sitting with people and, and hearing these like incredible tales of either people that I'd never met before, but were familial and connected to me or just stories about the country and all the history that they'd had. And so at that point I found that people would then, as these stories were going and people got more and more comfortable, they would kind of ask for their photo to be taken, some of which who had never actually seen what their image looked like on photo. And so I happened to have a Polaroid and like a small point and shoot digital camera and I managed to capture some of these images. And um, one thing I kind of, I think kind of speaking to some of the, some of the work that's been spoken to about before me is, um, I'd found that a lot of people's experiences with photographers were, um, the best way to describe it is, is, is take the shot and walk away, you know, like very disconnected experiences, oftentimes with, with white men. Um, and so some people that would initially weary were kind of surprised that I was also a person that had a camera with me and had a very different encounter with them. And it immediately changed the experience of photography. Like they'd even make jokes um, in, in Somali. Uh, the way to reference a white person is, is, is called Adan. And so they'd often say, what would they technically we would say is, um, we're used to just white people showing up and taking photos and walking away, you know? And so for me, the experience completely changed when it became a more about like, what image of yourself do you want to keep with you, you know? And so these next few shots are people's comfort opening up and letting me um, kind of capture them in the moments that they felt right. And uh, it was probably the best experience I've ever had. Um, and I plan on going back once COVID, COVID ends um, for a few more shots of, of connecting families in Somalia with their counterparts in Minneapolis, because a lot of families have actually been disconnected due to the immigration ban. And that's my Thank time. You. Thank you, Muna. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Great. Um, we're seeing comments. People want to talk to you about how beautiful the photographs and the stories that we see. Great. Um, well, hello. Um, I'm Michelle Al Sai, and I'm an artist and photographer from Bahrain. Um, I wanted to first of all thank the organizers for including me as part of this talk. Um, I'm going to focus mainly on Arab and Arab immigrant artists um, that uh, talk about um, unpacking personal histories and histories of home um, through image making. Um, the first photo I show here is Bursha Khalili's The Mapping Journey Project, which kind of details eight um, 
individual's um, journey through the Mediterranean basin um, and uses the, the image of a map as a, a way to kind of track the movements of these individuals. Um, what was really striking to me is that you know, migration some, is usually talked about in terms of a international movement, but um, one of the um, interesting um, portions of Khalili's project is that um, she also uh, tracks the movement of Palestinian through his own borders. So it's not necessarily a, con uh, a concern of transnational migration, but also within borders and the ways in which um, a lot of the communities in the Middle East have been disadvantaged due to the inability to, to um, move across um, uh, their own borders. Um, I then wanted to speak about uh, this beautiful piece by Mina Hatoum, which is Measures of Distance. Um, here she layers text, image, um, video in a very heartfelt way to talk about um, her disorientation as a uh, Palestinian artist in tracking and in tracking her ancestral lineage um, and in connecting with home. And for her, home is really a maternal, um, maternal concern um, and, is a, and uses the devices of um, nostalgia and in, of memory and of um, family members to kind of um, bridge the imagined and the longing for um, her homeland. Closer to home, um, and this is a huge issue um, in the Gulf region where I'm from, um, is the um, mistreatment of labor and migrant workers. Um, this is a work by Esmel Khouri, which uh, um, represents and, and tries to present the faces of the migrant workers, which comprises over 25 um, million people in the Gulf. Um, and where this kind of connects with uh, the subject of art is that in the building of mega institutions such as that of the Guggenheim, which has been um, um, kind of uh, put in the spotlight because of their lack of um, kind of focus on maintaining health and safety standards for these migrant workers. And also because of the kafala system that they have, uh, that have, is implemented whereby these migrant workers are working under sponsorship and thus can't integrate into the society and can't integrate as a citizen. Um, this kind of bars and kind of negates the institution of Arts when it's when coming to like building these mega institutions that are supposed to be representing um, a, a higher value for art and in and human values, um, these um, the ways in which that institution is being built um, compromises on its actual imaging. Um, it's really in in kind of tracking and doing the research about migrants. Um, stories it's for me all about also uncovering what is conscious and unconscious and the invisible stories and the invisible bodies um, that have been pushed to the periphery and that um, is part of the narrative of um, hegemonic structures um, my work here focuses on um, uh, the ways in which women are represented in media um, this and video installation titled Screen Time is uh, forged from um, work from video clippings in the 1970s era, era in Bahrain, where I'm from. And so uh, it, it takes, I'm, I'm kind of looking here and I'm trying to compile video um, footage of women in, who, are not, who have been traditionally discluded from the screen and placing them um, back onto um, the screen and, and in view and kind of act, uh, talking about how performance and surveillance and representations of women um, is made, especially considering this time period of the 1970s where um, Bahrain's um, protectorate, of the British protectorate kind of 
taken a step back and been involved in the country, but then also it is being it's during the time that uh, the Bahrain TV, which is a national TV station, is producing its own programming. Um, as um, as a Bahraini artist and in tracking this idea of memory and representation and um, my own ancestry and in the work of archiving material, I think it's, um, I think it's really humbling um, and it's really amazing to be looking at these Arab artists that are um, focusing their work on um, issues of the imagined homeland and in navigating these anxieties of home. And um, it's, it's, it's taking um, what has been put in the periphery and making it um, included as part of these conversations. And while, the, while, the solution, while making space for these um, artists is important, it's also important for the institution to kind of take an active part in representing these stories. Thank you so much. We look forward to our questions. Okay, Louise. Africa, Europe, and North America, with operations based out of New York, Geneva, Lisbon, and Luanda. Our hope is to bridge continents and connect people through the common language of art. Our goals are inspired by the three sustainable de development goals of the United Nations, quality education, gender equality, and reduction of inequalities. We all know how essential these issues have become and how important it is to educate our stronger, uh, how important it is to educate our youngest mind about them. Okay, so to continue, uh, these goals are reflected directly in our curatorial model and translated into our exhibitions and programs. To let th th this focus actually led me to focus on models like new museology and new institutionalism. Models that started in the 80s, in the rays of civil rights movement, requesting for equal exhibition opportunities for artists and artists of colors, issues that we still have to address today. So basically, new museology uh, advocates for more open narratives and also to bring the community to the art space. So my focus um, is on to exploring narratives that don't necessarily provide ready answers, but instead provoke questions and reflection. One example is the exhibition of Anna Silva that I curated in our pop-up space in Geneva, which I'll talk more a little later. So I wanted to bring up this 2019 diversity study in the major US museums collections. The study found that 85% of the artists are white and 87% are men, only 12% are women. This is significantly out of step with the US population at large, which is 61% white and 50.2% male. So we just hope to promote uh, diversity and ensure women and people of color are represented equally in all areas of our institution. We wanted to empower women and we set the example to all the institutions to follow. In response to that, our curatorial model also focused on the representation of female artists from Africa and the diaspora. I would like to, introdu to introduce three such artists, some, of, some from our collection, who are decisively impacted by the migration experience. So the first artist is Ana Silva. She is, uh, for me, uh, the perfect embodiment of our vision of inclusivity and diversity. Uh, she's also uh, experienced the, the migra she had the migratory experience very deeply. She experienced that very deeply in her career. Uh, Anna is from Angola, from a mixed background. Her grandfather were white Portuguese and her grandmother and mother were black Angolan. Her work, uh, her works reflect the influence of colonization on Angolan culture, both in meaning and medium. Lace, uh, where she favors a lot, it's actually from Portugal originally, but here they are used in an African context. Um, migration had, a great, had greatly affected her life and her career. Ultimately, she could only become an art by leaving Angola, where art materials were very scarce and there was no really access to art schools. Uh, the, the country was also raised by civil war. 
And when she moved to Europe, she encountered uh, another problem. Uh, she, she found an art world that was dominated by male in the same way that was back in Africa. So with the support of Africana, we were happy to give more uh, visibility to Juana's work. And she, could, uh, she was selected to, uh, by um, the Dakar Biennial in Senegal this year, as well as uh, the Africa 2020 exhibition of the Modern Art Museum in Paris is scheduled to open in September. So now I'm gonna talk about Frida Orubapu. She didn't experience uh, migration herself, but her father did. She was born to a Norwegian mother and a Nigerian father in Norway. Her link to Africa was never broken, but remains essential to her work. Orubapu often uses colonial photographs to investigate the way black women are portrayed as hypersexualized and as a subject of curiosity, curiosity and study. Africanity is omnipresent in her practice and she exemplifies uh, this inherited, what I call actually this inherited intellectual migration uh, that she actually uh, inherited from uh, her father. She mentioned in an interview that her memories from her early, early childhood are often related to the question of her identity, but she's fascinated with the idea of Nigeria and blackness. So the third art that I wanted to talk about, it's Indijika Akunili Crosby. Her work draws from her experiences growing up in Nigeria and then immigrating to the United States in her late teens. She used the technique of acetone transfer and Crosby adds collected images from family, friends, or also magazines, uh, found images that she transferred uh, to the canvas or to the paper. And that actually works perfectly with the message that she wants to pass. That is this idea of the transfer from a place to another, or um, how something's always lost during this transfer. When she's using the acetone technique, something's always lost. Crosby sees her role as an artist to highlight the Black immigrant experience. She also um, wants others to experience, others that, who experience immigration and migration to feel seen. She's interested in representing immigrants and their experience, but she's increasingly interested in the, expressing her anger, uh, the anger that she feels as a black woman living in the United States. So to conclude, I would like to leave a message. Uh, I think it's really, art is definitely a very powerful tool for expression. And in times of crisis, I think it's very essential that we use it also as a vehicle for change and empowerment. Thank you, Louise. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you all. We're going to open up and come back together. Um, Cheryl, you will begin with um, the questions. Thank you so much um, to all of the presenters for sharing your work and for beginning this dialogue in art. And I'd like to begin actually by asking each of you presenters if you have questions for your, for your co-presenters today, for any of your sister colleagues today before I uh, go to the questions that have been submitted by our participants. I'd like to make one question. It's, it's fascinating that lace mothers and grandmothers are linked to most of the work. So one of the questions that I have is what do you think about this this story of carrying these stories like Sama through the notion of the empty all of you are talking about carrying um, these stories so I'm just curious about that and can I add to that Deb um, because that was one of the threads that I saw too I, I kept writing down the word autobiographical especially as we had just finished last week's session talking about memoir and writing ourselves into stories, especially through and within uh, migration. And so I, I, I think that if we can maybe also think about this, you know, pun intended, this thread um, uh, through the story, um, using uh, Lace as your model, uh, Deb and, and, and Leslie, um, but to think about, you know, these kinds of threads, even through, um, you know, when I look at um, the work um, that, you know, that Sama and Michelle have, um, have also presented, Muna as well, 
through the veil um, and through different types of fabric. So maybe if we could talk mm -hmm. about um, autobiography as well and sort of, um, you know, this notion mm -hmm. of, um, of how many of your stories are, are multi-generational stories um, going back and, and sort of tracing through migration family roots. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, I'll take a stab at it um, because I've been obsessed with lace and fiber and the interlacing stories that come from generations of women who have uh, not found means um, in mainstream canons to have their work recognized, expressed, and affirmed. Um, I often look at the doilies and the laces that I have from my family's collection who actually executed them to the, to the unknown anonymous women work that we don't know that has been discarded as mandalas, um, as meditations, uh, personal meditations that I think help them get through the traumas of their migrations, of the lives that they were living, of the families and the responsibilities that they had. And so in the in-between spaces of the laces, I also look to position elements. Sometimes I put shells in those open spaces because the shells also evoke sound and they have texture and they have layer and they have memory and they have positioning. And oftentimes women's, I, I know that my grandmother, I have her, her small sassafras baskets with the lace handkerchiefs in it and shells that were on the outside and shells that I think she had a particular affinity for that she kept in this little sacred box. So I think it's an area that, that bears uh, the need of a, a lot of in-depth thought. And I too was very struck by the multi-generational stories of women who were connected to their grandfathers and excuse me, their grandmothers and their great grandmothers and the use of the fibers, especially um, the dyed fabrics. Oh, I wanted to see those more and more and more. Um, these are stories that we've lost and we need to reclaim, um, find ways to make them more paramount in our history. Anyone else? I'm sure I'll go. Uh, so in a lot of my um, work, you can see um, the Palestinian thobe um, and the embroidery work that is on there. There was actually an image that I probably didn't have on that PowerPoint, but um, that's actually called spools, which is threads. And um, I, my mother is um, uh, a seamstress, designer, tailor, so is my grandmother. That's our sort of uh, lineage. Um, you know, you, uh, families tend to labor in the same kind of field um, mm -hmm. over generations. And so uh, from my earliest work, I uh, was very interested in these textiles because the embroidery work, tell they tell stories. They tell stories about location. Uh, Palestinians, uh, women, can tell um, historically, they could tell from which village you were from by yeah. the kind of embroidery work on on the globe, and so um, in a way that uh, documents and books and how um, narratives that are more official by the state, such as Israel, can't account or will not account or erases our um, history in that land and that that we lived there. These these clothes, these thobes basically do articulate that history. The embroidery work have stayed consistent for over a thousand years. Um, and uh, while um, diaspora and displacements have created obviously a kind of um, a problem where there's a severing of traditional knowledge, these are kind of activities that are being um, uh, pushed to be relearned and re-understood. So um, the intellectual memory of, of, of of the kind of inheritance I, I possess, right, which is memories, uh, readings and research and family narratives are also physically materialized in this work. And I have worked on that throughout various projects. I just want to jump on that last statement. Um, I think, Sama, you put it really well in your talk about the feminization of land and the ways in which the land is considered female, um, especially in terms of um, ancestral storytelling and in reconjuring of um, um, 
like childhood stories um, in the region and worldwide. Um, there seems to be a correlation between the land and the female body and the ways in which we carry that on in stories for children and in the way that we imagine the land as, as a mother, as someone that we welcome back to and um, we can connect to through our ancestral lineage. Thank you, Michelle. So I want to kind of continue along, again, pun intended, uh, on this thread. Um, and there's a question here um, for Delphine um, about uh, fabric and textile. Why was it important to involve textile in your photographic series? Why batik specifically? Does it hold particular metaphors? Yes, it does. Um, actually, my grandmother, that's how she um, sent her children to school was by hand making batiks. And in her um, town in Pujang and um, West Africa, Sierra Leone, she was known for her fabrics. So you could see it anywhere and you'll know that Adama made those fabrics. And so that was the one thing that connected me to home, this place that I always knew to be home, even though I was born here in America, were these fabrics. So even the fabrics that you, you're seeing there, some of the, many of them are older than me. So I've been collecting them. So it was very important for me, just as everyone is saying, to continue, you know, to continue to share these stories and, you know, make them live in the world because it's a, you know, it's, it's a sign of living and a sign of continuing and evolution. So yes, yeah, very important. But then I also think about the fabrics and the way that in which the batiks are made as a, as our, as something that is metaphoric for identity and how our identities are so layered and so complex. Like even when you think about the process of making these colors and patterns and how they all, and I, and I like to think of identity as not this you know, monolithic thing, but this thing that's completely complex. And the more that we see ourselves as complex beings, I think that the more closer we are to uh, humanity. Yeah. Great. Thank you, um, Adama. Uh, Sorry, there's a B. Um, so there was a question here from Deborah Ambush, um, and it begins, Dr. Hammond, uh, Toni Morrison talks about going to the site of memory and interpreting the remains of what is there. And, and this is, I think, coming from the piece that with some of the panelists who were on, um, Ellen, you were there, of course, and, and Deb, too, from last week when we talked about memoir. We were talking about Toni Morrison's work on memory. Um, and so the question continues, and I, I think this is a question that, um, that I'd like for everyone to consider. Um, the question is, what is liberatory about this act of artistic interrogation in the midst of our double strand pandemic of racism and physical genocide? Where does apartheid collapse from ancestral memory? Where does apartheid collapse from ancestral memory? And again, I think we can, we can continue along thinking about, you know, fabric and veils and, and different layers of, of memories. We can think about the onion, we can think about the land and, and you know, growing and, and also sort of the rhizomorphic nature of memory as well in addressing this question. Okay, as we address this last question, we only have seven minutes and then it will cut off directly. So just remember that as you wrap up. One of the things that, and, and, the, and the question is powerful and it goes right to the work that I see in all of us that we're doing. Uh, fiber has, uh, I'm, I obsess about it. I dream about it. I, I even save my hair because I figure it's a fiber and I, I need to figure out how this fits within the story because I have stories in my family with that lineage. But with fiber, I also look at the fact that it is an empowering, liberating form to work in. Um, I cannot work out with my fiber without my scissors. And my scissors are a power tool to me because I can cut and I can reframe and I can section out works and images in ways that have meaning to me regardless of how the fabric was woven or how it was dyed or how it was found in a Goodwill shop, I then have the power to reframe its context and put it into the proper narrative that I feel is critical to the story that I want to tell. So just to follow that up, Muna, you showed um, 
the homes of the way that people were right the shades it's the same type of quilting right. fabric the mm -hmm. same use that leslie and and delphine and, and carolina are right. describing um, right. you want to follow up with that in 30 seconds <laughs> yeah um i mean i i think leslie's kind of answered it and most of our, our our talks spoke to it as well um in somali culture specifically fabrics are life right it's what you mm -hmm carry down generationally and all the fabrics that I've received from my family all have histories that I don't even know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think as, as we all continue to work, maybe it's finding ways to elaborate on how all the different fabrics actually have ties to each other across right. continents and across right. culture. Right. And one thing I just wanted to add to Muna with regard to the first image that you showed that, that photograph, it, it's so Carrie Mae Weems' Mirror, Mirror. I don't know if you have anything to say about that, if that's something that was an influence for you. I think everything that Carrie's done has been an influence in, in a lot of the work that I produce. But yes, I mean, I think uh, identity formation and uh, questioning is a huge part of a lot of the work that we create. And she's one of the greatest artists to, to, to push out work like that. Can I just add one other thing that's very important about fiber that what we seem to kind of dismiss in a certain way. Fiber structure is interlocking, it's interwoven, and it is a metaphor for life, all right? So when we don't have life functioning in the way that we envision or hope for, it is a, a substance, a, a materiality that we can deconstruct, reconstruct, repurpose, upcycle. It is so fluid, it is so porous, it is so flexible to the narrative traditions, to the oral traditions of our ancestry, that women, we almost do it unconsciously. We are hardwired. We're literally hardwired. And so as we uh, away- first, Carolina has a, um, a point, yeah. that's really great. No, just, just to add really quickly that um, in one of those pieces that I showed, I'm wearing um, typical, uh, typical Colombian dress for cumbia dance. And um, so I usually use these customs as, as symbolic. As so for example, this, this um, piece of, um, this, this custom that I was wearing, it was um, worn by slaves. Um, they they mm -hmm. would uh, put them on to slaves. It was kind of like a uniform to separate the slaves from the ladies. So it also has all this content or this symbolic um, idea of how uh, it's not just a normal fabric, it's not, the, it's, it's a pattern and it's a style that it was meant to be that way. And it carries along and it became part of our co Colombian culture. Um, mm -hmm. But it, it started in, in that way to, sec it, it was a, 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 a way of segregating. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? Yes, I would like to add, especially after what Leslie and Dauphine said, uh, something that I see very clearly in the work of Anna Silva, this idea of using mm -hmm. lace, mm -hmm. something that was co received from the colonization, but that she didn't know until she left Angola to find mm -hmm. out that she was a heritage. They were using this as a way to pass uh, the knowledge between women, to stay together mm -hmm. in the moment mm -hmm. that Angola was uh, in big war. Mm -hmm. So uh, th that idea of keeping the, the woman together, this passive of passage of knowledge, and also uh, uh, using uh, fabric or lace or, uh, to create uh, some type of revenue for the, for the family. It's uh, the, the power uh, that uh, I see very often in the African, African diaspora and the African artists that I work mm -hmm. with. It looks like LP. Uh -huh. Oh yeah, I also wanted to say, even just as artists and as women making this work, using these um, memories and these materials, it's also a way to say that we're here, like in a world that sometimes refuses to see us. And right. here's our evidence from our ancestors. And I feel like right. sometimes we always have to continue to prove this point that we're human beings. And to the point when we could not have to do that anymore. You know, I think like right now during this pandemic and during this you know, extreme heightened, not really heightened, it's always been like this, but this racial tension is something that people are screaming is that 
we are human beings and we've always mm-hmm. been human beings. Even if we were enslaved, we were still human beings then. Even if we were colonized, we were still human beings then and we're still human beings now, which is really important for at some point this world to wake up and acknowledge. That's a great ending. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Um, we, Cheryl, did you want to say anything else or we will? I, I, I think Delphine, you know, you've all said it all and that was a really just bringing it back to, I think we began Mm -hmm. at the very beginning of the month with this, you know, assertion and affirmation of our humanity. Um, And I think that that's a great place to end. So thank you all so much for your work and for your contributions. Yeah, so we received a a number of thank yous and respect for the works and everything and we will you can respond to the individual questions later and Mm -hmm. the team will come back in a few minutes okay okay thank you thank Thank you you. thank you very much everybody